short introduction for the main introduction. Uh, and uh, of course, Anka is invited to pronounce this main introduction. Uh, she's the one who built uh, at the New York College a uh, very solid and important art history community. Uh, and uh, I think uh, Ada's project uh, is a part of this uh, strong community. Uh, I just wanted to tell you on behalf of Lelia here, who worked close with Ada uh, in the administration of uh, the grant. And uh, uh, on my part, that uh, we are um, very glad to see you and very glad to hear you, but we would have preferred to hear you in other, well, three, two or three years. Uh, anyway, I know the efforts you have done to uh, prolong uh, the project and uh, we are grateful to you all for the quality of your research uh, and uh, for the quality of your friendship uh, to Ada. Um, I just, well, I am very interested in what you have uh, to say today and uh, I will pass uh, the word to Anka welcome you all and uh, assure you that uh, uh, NEC will always be open uh, as much as you need uh, to all of you. Uh, other projects, new projects, new ideas, please feel welcome to come here whenever online or in a physical uh, presence, whenever you, you feel the need to do it. Our library, everything is open for your access and uh, you are always welcome here. Thank you. Well, thank you, Valentina. I don't want to prolong the introductory part of this meeting and to uh, eat up time which is best uh, used for uh, the discussions with the team. But I do want to welcome you all, to greet you all here, and to thank you for having joined us, joined us in this. As you know, um, what we proposed uh, was uh, entitled a pro progress report from the team of the ERC project, which was originally led by ADA, proposed, won, and led by ADA. Uh, it's almost a year since she no longer is with us. Uh, and um, in, entitled, in, in, in giving it this title, we what we want to avoid uh, at all cost is to make it um, an administrative formality. And this is why we invited you all, not just the current fellows, but also some of the colleagues of ADA, some of the former fellows, uh, a few among the uh, participants in the Getty seminar in which uh, ADA and uh, Mihna and uh, you all the team have been present so as to continue somehow a community out of which also this project and other projects uh, may come. Um, so um, what I want to uh, say is that we try with this event to do a measure of justice to the team which worked very hard in uh, uh, bringing to uh, an early closure a uh, project that would have lasted for five years and in the end only will, will only last for five for for three sorry and also it's an occasion for us to remember Ada who is on our minds frequently uh, and to let know something about her ideas and her uh, initiatives uh, to those who didn't know her. And I am uh, particularly uh, moved and grateful uh, to have with us uh, Mrs. Liniana Haidu, Ada's mother, and Eugen Stefanuz, Ada's companion for a long time. Um, I can't greet you all uh, in person, but um, I am very pleased to see you all. And I'd like now to introduce the team very briefly and then pass them the floor. Um, first of all, uh, Shona Kaustrup, 
who uh, has been in the team um, um, senior fellow uh, and who is uh, now uh, its supervisor. She uh, has taken over these obligations uh, a year or so ago when we uh, were told that the project needed to close. Uh, she's associate lecturer at the School of Art History at, at the University of St. Andrews uh, in uh, Oxford. Dr. Magdalena Kuninska from the Aguilonian University, also a senior fellow in the project. Dr. Mihna Mihail, uh, assistant professor at the National University of Arts and research assistant in the team. Uh, and the two postdocs, uh, Dr. Anna Adashinskaya and Dr. Kosmin Mina, whom most of you uh, know. And that said, I'd like to invite Ada to start, uh, Ada, sorry, excuse me, please. Shona to start and you to continue uh, with this um, comments and descriptions of what you managed to achieve. I know it's a lot. Uh, and how you see eventually the continuation of this project beyond uh, beyond its uh, formal closure. Thank you all and Shona, the floor is yours. Thank you Anka for such a, a kind introduction and we are truly grateful that so many of you have, have turned out today to um, celebrate Ada's vision and to reflect on her final project. And on behalf of all the team, I'd like to offer, offer our deepest gratitude for the support which so many of you have extended to us um, since we lost Ada only 18 months into this five-year project. We owe a special debt to New York College for the unwavering stability, for the exceptional administrative, moral and academic support that it's given to, to our project in these last 10 months, especially during our protracted negotiations with the ERC about the project's future. Um, Thank you to Alina Hera for her calm, calm and, and pragmatic solutions to our endless administrative queries. And in particular, we, we can't thank Professor Oroviano enough for her steadfast, ever-present advice, for her belief in our ability to continue Ada's work, for her willingness to fight our battles and help us negotiate the almost Byzantine idiosyncrasies of the ERC platform, and for her kind consideration for our future plans. Anyway, despite the loss of ADA, despite the challenges of COVID, despite our inability to meet in person as a team for 18 months now, we've achieved a range of good results, which we would like to share with you today. Each of the five of us is going to speak in turn, so our presentation will be a little bit longer than the 45 minutes that I understand is, is standard for a NEC seminar. Yes, I forgot to say this, and uh, please, uh, please forgive me, Shona. It's not a standard seminar, and so we decided to be more... Uh, lenient, elastic in terms of time, especially since there are uh, five speakers and they will speak about a very rich and uh, um, multi-faceted uh, project. So please uh, accept this, but there will be some time for questions and answers. Yes, most certainly, yes. So I'll give you um, a brief talk about the, the project itself, its aims and our achievements. And then my colleagues will offer some reflection on the core theoretical concepts of the project as we try to engage with them and some of um, examples of results that we've found so far. Um, I should state that although the funding for the project ends this summer, the work it has germinated will continue to permeate our future research and hopefully 
the, the collaborative projects of all the team members. And, and thank you very much for, for the, the knowledge that, that we can uh, hopefully keep interacting with, with NEC in, in the future. That's lovely to know. So let me just start by quickly reiterating the initial aims of the project as Ada conceived it. We set out to look at the construction of art historical discourses in various regions of East Central Europe in the period 1850 to 1950. This period was of interest because it was then that art history really emerged as an academic discipline in the regions. And of course, this was the age of nation building. And so art history inevitably became bound up as a tool of national discourse. Of particular interest to us was not just the manner in which these art histories were constructed and the material they addressed, but the ways in which conceptually, strategically, theoretically, they related to art histories formulated in other countries. And by that, I mean, not just the, the big centers in Western Europe, so Paris, Vienna, Berlin, Leipzig, and so on, but also within the region itself. We acknowledge that there had been some very good prior attempts to address these histories, notably people like Matthew Rampley and Jan Bakosh and Jerzy Malinowski and Robert Bourne, who, who, who are known to many of you. But we also identified some problems as well as a specific methodological approach that we wanted to engage with. And, and that approach was um, the one of histoire croisée or entangled histories. The first problem was that the history of art history in East Central Europe was under-researched. Secondly, those histories of art history that had been produced by scholars from the region sometimes lacked self-reflexivity. They were also rarely comparative and they could at times be quite nationalistic, descriptive and uncritical. Thirdly, when scholars had thought outside the national box and looked for connections with other countries, the tendency had always been to mark relationship to the scholarship produced in Western Europe rather than explore what was going on in neighboring states, especially where there were competing irredentist interests. So Ada felt that a different kind of comparative transnational approach was needed. And this is why she was so interested in Espana, Werner and Zimmermann's concept of entangled histories. She pointed out that, for example, art historiographies conceived in Romania and the Yugoslav Kingdom had been researched individually or in relation to French or Viennese schools of art history, but no one had ever looked at how they related to each other. And just before we lost Ada, she was working on the entanglements of Bulgarian, Serbian and Romanian architectural histories and was, we believe, unique in doing so. Similarly, Anna has been doing excellent work looking at Russian involvement in the Balkans and how discourses produced in this sphere can be compared to the better known Austro-Hungarian art historical interest in the region. Now at, at the heart of many of the structural problems we have encountered in these art historiographies has been the issue of center and periphery. It's a paradigm that we all know has been subject to critical scrutiny for, for quite some time now. And as um, the, the Getty periodization seminar has shown, it's opened up refreshing new methodological discussions around things like circulations and translations, horizontal art history, network theory, global art history, and the lives of objects. But it still dominates discourses in and about East Central Europe and was embedded in the way that early art histories were constructed. 
In part, it explains why historians from East Central Europe often preferred to relate their local art to what they identified as the centers, rather than thinking about it in a regional context. And it's also present in the ways that recent studies of art historiography have prioritized relations to established schools of thought, particularly in Western Europe, rather than looking for interdependencies between regionally produced discourses. So all of us in our research have had to confront the dominance of the center periphery paradigm as a central methodological issue. And this, together with the challenges of, of trying to put the, the methodology of entangled histories into practice, is something that Cosmin will reflect on in, in more detail shortly. I just want to share um, just an image as I do the, the next part of this. Um, give me a second to bring up my screen. There, is that visible to you all? Let me know if it's not. Um, conceptually then, Ada encouraged us to go out and look for blind spots, both in the way art historians of the region overlooked, willingly or not, pockets of research, and also in the way those studying the writing of art history have prioritised certain discourses and turned a blind eye to others. Often the problem has been a simple one of language and access. You know, what one of the biggest barriers to the kind of research we've been doing is the need to read a lot of languages. Um, but fortunately we have Anna, who I think can read every language on the planet. I think dwelling on the other problems we faced would be somewhat solipsistic. I mean, everyone in the last year has suffered from lack of access to archives and face-to-face -face research opportunities. What I'll finish with though is a, an overview of some of our activities and outputs so far. ADA structured the project around an investigation of three key concepts, periodization, style and influence. These concepts, as my colleagues will explore shortly in more detail, have been very useful and they've also been extremely entangled. We found you can't talk about one without the others inevitably becoming involved. Our original work plan envisaged three international conferences, one devoted to each con uh, concept in turn. And as you know, we held the first on, on periodization in, in late November, 2019. Uh, we enjoyed a very good range of papers as, as many of you uh, will have um, shared with us. And we're now turning these into a, an open access volume for Routledge. And of course, um, the, the phasing out of the grant means that unfortunately, the other two planned conferences will not now take place. That notwithstanding, the team has been very active at other international events. And I know what, I'm just gonna flick through these, but together we've given around 25 conference papers in the course of the project as well as being involved in the organization of a number of, of further events. Uh, team members have got three books under contract. Um, the, the primary one, of course, is the, the periodization book with Routledge. We've also written 12 further book chapters and we have 10 articles in print and forthcoming. In terms of knowledge exchange activities, we've given a number of public lectures as well as written blog posts for our website and elsewhere. And I'd just like to finish by saying that, you know, one of the great highlights of our project has, has been our ability to participate in ANCA's Getty sponsored seminar on, on periodization, um, whose next instalment we're, we're looking forward to very much a, a week today. So I'll now hand over to my colleagues who will offer some reflections on the core concepts that have structured our project and on the findings we've made. So Michnia will talk about periodization, uh, Magda will talk about style, 
and then Anna will talk about influence. So Michna, can I hand over to yes. you to share your screen? Yes, thank you, Shona. Uh, I will uh, share my screen now and please uh, let me know if everything was, works fine. Yes, it does, it does. <laughs> okay. Um, so, um, about half a century ago, in a short notice dedicated to the criteria of periodization in the history of European art, Meyer Shapiro pointed to the fact that, although conventional, periods might not be without use for the art historian. As a process, the slicing up of history, and it should work, yeah, uh, the slicing up of history into pieces can be a useful instrument which permits the observation of similarities and differences of historical objects. Since Shapiro's optimistic statement, much debate has been generated around the issue of periodization, with a constant striving for revealing its conundrums and questioning its basic principles in order to expand or vary the canon of art history. At the same time, periodization has been persistently redefined and new concepts related to time have been proposed in order to offer art historians solutions of thinking in an adequate historical manner about images. As recently argued by Keith Moxie and Dan Karlhoen, the ever multiplying chronologies and temporalities point to a post-historical condition that puts under question the relevancy of the history in art history and the discipline as a whole. Therefore, by presenting itself as a discipline of historical knowledge, art history is inextricably determined, shaped by, and manifested through manifold modes of thinking about time and historical development. At this moment, it is commonly accepted that the ways in which historians have chosen to divide the past into general workable pieces has proven to be inefficient, and that there is no coherent system that works equally well for all periods and all parts of the world. The implication that there exists a single timeline, common and relevant for everyone, a chronology that can be meaningfully expanded so that it includes all visual representation, be they what we canonically call artistic or not, has been scrutinized, dismantled and rejected. But despite the current self-consciousness of discipline and the in-depth analysis of its foundations, periodization still remains an actual problem. It still is dominantly embedded in university curricula, titles of academic organizations, titles of specialized journals, and sometimes even in job titles, leading back to the thorny question of whether one can practically, and not just from a theoretical standpoint, rise above the proven inadequacies of periodization. By focusing on Central and Eastern European art historiographies, our project had and still has a lot at stake in tackling the issue of periodization. The need for synchronicity and the battle for filling the time gaps created by belatedness imposed on the regions in question by dominant historiographies have been at the core of the subject ever since the establishment of art history as an academic discipline in the second half of the 19th century. Even though not concerned with art history, the words of Harry Harotunian reflect the difficulties and traps that local art histories had to confront. According to Harotunian, because of the strategy that established a normative path to the realization of modernity, exemplified by Euro-America, much of the world was cast in its shadow, this time to endless delay and the distant prospect of catch-up. Uh, the obscured world that the historian was referring to is in our project, the region of Central and Eastern Europe a geographical delimitation that we chose because it was marked by the center periphery paradigm that lays at the core of our geography, no matter the period or subject under question. While space is an important part of this principle, Fotini Vlahu, the late Fotini Vlahu recently argued by asking the question, why spatial? That the relationship between center and periphery is more a problem of time than of geography. Our first and main attempt to investigate the use of periodizations in art historiographies revolved around the conference that we organized at NEC in 2019, and that uh, was happily coupled with uh, the Getty NEC periodization uh, seminar coordinated by Professor Anka Orovanu. And this now continued through our ongoing editorial work for our hopefully soon to be published proceedings volume. We believe that the chapters that are included in this volume witness the crucial impact that concepts of periodization had on the creation of national art historiographies. 
the contributions prove the relevancy of a wide array of closely related art historical basic notions, such as style, influence, or heritage, that have enforced the way the development of arts history has been presented. In addition to these concerns that are more or less circumscribed to the discipline of art history, the bigger picture reveals the ideological intricacies that are involved in any framing of history, and that, in words borrowed from Matthew Rampley's contribution to our volume, and I quote, there is no form of time that is not a social construct, end of quote. Most of our contributors stress the importance of the relationship between historiography and state ideology. Art historical narratives and their implicit periodizations were always attuned to nationalist claims and the discourses that underpinned the way history was conceived. Concentrating either on historical, social, and political contexts or on institutions, textbooks, or exhibitions, the chapters included in our volume prove the usefulness of applying a comparative analysis that broadens the framework of discussions beyond national boundaries. Just as periodizations are constituted by the stylistic categories that inform them, be they aesthetic, cultural, or dynastic, national and local art histories were dependent on the extant heritage. As argued by Cristina Joicalda in our volume, the so-called Hanseatic brick architecture of the Baltic region determined Wilhelm Neumann to promote Estonian medieval architecture in light of its links with German examples of towns belonging to the Hansa. At the opposite spectrum, Heinz Pirang's history of Baltic art takes its cue from post-1700 manor houses, which are evaluated as true forms of an autonomous revival. At times, the authors included in our volume examine the centrality of monuments in periodizing national artistic developments and in establishing connections with Western form categories of art that were important in the chronological sequencing of patrimony. As with the case presented by Timo Hagen, the winning design for the Church of the Metropolitan Cathedral of the Holy Trinity in Sibiu was determined by the Western periodization of Byzantine art. The way the periodization of Byzantium was conceptualized, as glorious before 1453 and marked by decay after the fall of Constantinople, was important in establishing some normative models that Miron Christa, a church representative and key figure in the contest for the project, took into consideration when aiming for a church design that would remind the viewer of the Western celebrated canon. More than stressing uniqueness and difference, which by themselves cannot be conceptualized without referencing a canon, our volume aims to address the entangled aspects of local historiographies, the interdependence of their development, and the means through which models were adapted, reconfigured, or rejected. That doesn't mean that the dominant model was expurgated. As Keith Moxie argues, the time of Western Europe and North America is that, I quote, against which all others are calibrated. Whether these hierarchies are accepted or challenged, it is utopian to pretend they do not exist. The periphery may claim a distinct time frame, asynchronous, non contemporaneous, even ahistorical, but the power structure that relegated it remains intact. End of quote. Indeed, geographical inclusion and the canonization of art from regions that were newly erected at centers proved to do little for changing the rules of the game and for altering the basic principles of the process. However, while getting rid of periodization might imply, as some skeptics argued, purging art history and morphing it into a new discipline, our aim was to overcome pre-established judgment by using approaches that are more nuanced and historiographically aware. In order to do this, we focused more on the mechanisms of producing art historical literature, on the processes of selection, exclusion, and adaptation that art historians mobilized when addressing national heritage. In the words of our deeply missed principal investigator, Ada Haidu, our objective was, and still is, I quote, to challenge not only received knowledge about Central and Eastern European art historians, but also the foundations of art historical studies in the region. As Ada argued, and uh, I quote again, contemporary art historians are still rather more inclined to relate to the art history published in Western countries than to the writings produced in the region. If the usefulness of periodizations in general has been questioned before, the established periodizations of Central and Eastern European art histories have not been systematically compared or criticized." End of quote. 
Our hope is that through our project, we will encourage art historians to reflect on the use of these tools and their applicability for their own studies. Needless to say, more work still has to be done. As we, as a team, frequently discussed, taking into consideration the presence of minorities and their implication in art historical narratives might help in further rendering the complexities of this issue. Additionally, periodization is only one facet of the analysis dedicated to art historiographies, which can hardly be considered outside its entanglement with the concepts of style or influence about which my colleagues will um, soon discuss. And uh, now if I may uh, end on a more uh, personal note, which I uh, actually never do, but uh, I felt the need to do it now. Uh, in the month of November, 2019, uh, thanks to Professor uh, Anko Rovanu and the New York College, uh, Ada and I had the opportunity to accompany Thomas da Costa Kaufman uh, on a trip uh, in Transylvania. And uh, during our journey, we uh, visited um, the parish church of uh, Sebe Shalba, which you have here in uh, the image. And uh, this place was uh, of particular interest for Ada because of uh, what she called uh, little humans in the trilobes, the ones which you see on the right and which you see on the left, uh, Ada photographing them. Uh, despite not being a medievalist herself, Ada was uh, incessant in trying to find out uh, the meaning behind these figures. And um, it is a small fact, but uh, it is an image that I think reflects her untiring curiosity and constant need for questioning art historical tenets and the overlooked aspects of the discipline, which were a guiding principle for ASO and that brought into existence um, this project. And um, I think this might apply to thinking about periodization and other related concepts as well, uh, because we might not be able to dethrone the tyranny of uh, periodization, but uh, we can and should always scrutinize and critically approach our objects of study as well as the discourses that shape uh, their afterlives. Thank you. And uh, now I will pass uh, the virtual microphone to uh, Magda. Thank you. And I will try to share my presentation. Uh, I hope, can you see it? And I will. You can, yes, thank you. And I will check. Okay, uh, I think that uh, all the problems we are talking about are entangled as uh, in their nature. And I will try to say something about style. And I decided for uh, this because uh, it was uh, one of the last uh, topics I had the chance to discuss with Ada uh, while preparing my uh, submission for the Rome conference uh, about style. And um, I will share some of my general remarks on style as entangled uh, case, uh, like uh, recognizing common places in East Central Europe and Balkans. And uh, I had to start with uh, sharing the picture from the Oxford, from the, the making of the Humanities International Conference in the September of uh, 2017. Uh, and uh, when we first met there with Ada and Cosmin also in September 2017, we were a rather strange group of people from East and Central Europe trying to deal with the beginnings of the art historiographies and monument protection in their countries by looking into more general models. It didn't work. Uh, as Ada proposed in her uh, speech there, uh, we should... Uh, rather uh, incorporate uh, uh, the position like uh, from uh, Roman Daskawo's uh, book, uh, The Making of Nation in the Balkans, Historiography of the Bulgarian Revival, and uh, the perspective when all studies uh, embedded, for example, Bulgarian, but not only revival within the Balkan and Central European context by recognizing common features rather than treating it in isolation. Uh, it was her, her characteristic of so many national historians. Uh, my first remark is, as uh, Mikna also emphasized that all uh, and the first entanglement in our project is between 
all uh, main topics because as we can see uh, the concept of periodization when we use for example the classical study of uh, Wilbert Zauerländer uh, we uh, can see that uh, when we uh, use it as a tool for art history uh, the style uh, is uh, highly connected with the time and uh, that's why and that's our project starts uh, we group this concept together and uh, treat them then as uh, interrelated and consider them accordingly unfortunately we had no chance to uh, more uh, develop our style so uh, when we treat a style construct uh, following James Ackerman theory of style, uh, we can uh, notice that the style is a generalization which we form by comparing individual works into shapes that are convenient for historical and critical purposes, or for history to be written at all, we must find in what we study factors which at once are consistent enough to be distinguishable and changeable enough to have a story. But also, and I think that the, for the uh, situation in uh, our countries uh, is more suitable, uh, we should uh, treat style as uh, the concept of style as, as uh, Wojtek Bowes did in uh, his book about uh, uh, neo-gothical architecture. The concept of style becomes a shield, a vial that allows us to look and at an architectural phenomenon and make it something known and tame. And uh, I would add from myself also performative because the concept of style is always engaged in a kind of political statement. And uh, we could, uh, after reading of a uh, lot of chapters for our general volume on periodization, we could recognize some uh, general strategies. Uh, there is a kind of dynamic relation between the general or model style uh, and particular features or so-called national styles. And uh, I uh, split them uh, into East and West. Uh, the model style uh, is an uh, ideal Byzantine shrine uh, like uh, the case of Romania after uh, 1859, uh, but uh, the local versions were Brankovenaska and Latin origins, and it was uh, the topic of uh, Cosmin's research, uh, vernacular origins of style, uh, it, and it was the topic of Shona's uh, really wide research, or uh, in the same region, Bulgarian Byzantine style as a part of Bulgarian revival, and it was a part of others' research, uh, or for example, the 17th century Russia uh, revival in uh, Russia. Uh, in the case of, for example, Poland or uh, Croatia, uh, we have uh, our medieval past uh, in contrast to national version, versions of it or its vernacular origins. And uh, we should treat the adaptation of style and the ways of research uh, in words of uh, peripheries and their creativity, uh, as Lucille Mallard wrote in the uh, chapter to the book Nations and Nationalism, uh, I quote, the creativity of peripheries has recently emerged as a prominent line of scholarship. From a post-colonial perspective, Walter Mignolo called for research into how borders contribute to the world system of knowledge. Pascal Canova suggested that writers at the margins of Europe were more receptive to innovation. And Nigat and Strang have argued that peripheries are more open to creative eclecticism, while actors in cultural calls regard local ideas as universal. And of course, the other uh, theoretical position is uh, this one of Piotr Piotrowski's and framing uh, Central uh, Europe toward the horizontal history, what Piotrowski uh, wrote, language is the most sensitive instrument which we can perceive as the genius Lotzi, which best expresses the artist's identity and which may become the best starting point for the reconstruction of the artistic geography. Thus, it is not the recognition of similarities, but of differences that may invalidate the hierarchical approach to geography. Developing his or her analysis, a revisionist geographer of East Central Europe should reveal what is different or the 
other from the Western idiom. Instead of coming up with the requirement of learning it as necessary condition of being marked on the artistic map on the world. The art of Czechoslovakia, Romania and Hungary was developing in different semiotic and ideological spaces than the art of Italy or France, where the universal perspective understood as methodological instrument prevents the discovery of particular meanings of cultures and disrupts all attempts at defining the regional ethnics and local identities. One can easily understand the psychological breakdown, background of the frustration of art historians from Eastern and in particular Central Europe caused by the absence of our cultural production in the canon of artistic culture of the continent with a few exceptions and its peripheral uh, location. Yet the point is not to reproduce the imperialist and hierarchical interpretive interpretive model, but to revise the paradigms, to change the analytical tools so that they would allow us to discover the meanings of cultures of other geograph geographical uh, regions. And I would put some uh, examples of this uh, schema I created. So this idea versus national version of style and particular decisions like uh, Timo Hagen wrote about uh, the Cathedral of Holy Trinity in Sibiu in the 1906 uh, as built in a truly Byzantine and truly Romanian style. And uh, as Cosmin wrote, uh, this kind of reflecting on style was an attempt to make, to fit monuments into ideal erasing uh, their peculiarities uh, from local peculiarities. The other example is, uh, this local uh, peculiarity is, is, of course, Berkovenaska uh, and the study of Cosmin of the Church of Cathedral around. And finally, and there, there's a voice of Ada from Oxford presentation in uh, 2017. Uh, the same uh, mechanism is also present in Bulgaria when uh, in the competition uh, for the national. Uh, Museum, uh, we have uh, some uh, circumstances like it will be built in the Bulgarian people in honor of the struggle for church independence and political independence. The building of the museum has to be in the Bulgarian Byzantine style. Uh, and other traces for sources of inspiration, medieval and Ottoman buildings on the territory of Bulgaria and Macedonia. And we can with easiness uh, multiply uh, examples from around uh, our uh, region. But the conclusion is uh, more uh, general. Uh, when we start from uh, the topic of the project, uh, the research uh, was going to show that so three concepts are far from neutral or strictly descriptive and their use is, needs to be reconsidered. And uh, the process in our regions uh, works like uh, the constant movement of positioning on the map of, on Eastern, Byzantine or Western tradition uh, and uh, using mechanisms of rationalization the, of the past in terms of style versus, of course, and the uh, uh, historical circumstances like uh, colonization by architecture. And this is an example of uh, Cathedral of Alexander Nevsky in Warsaw built in uh, Russian uh, or Byzantine style, but also by art historiography. Uh, and it's a case of St. Pantheon Church in St. Stanislaus, now shaped in Kovo in near uh, Halic, uh, where the uh, Western civilization was bordered by recognizing Romanesque features of this building. On the uh, right, we have an uh, illustration from uh, Crown Prince Ferg, uh, also uh, showing uh, this uh, building. Uh, and the spe special case of Poland is, of course, not for, uh, far from all this uh, schema. And in Poland, we had uh, about three approaches to style and then highly abstractive uh, 
taken from uh, Hegelian historiosophy, Perot Vyashnazes and Kuglas Henbishar, and sustaining the met metaphysical notion of architecture as the highest achievement of human spirit, and because of that, postulating its position as the first choice for the search. Then we had a really uh, important uh, truth for the field of research, uh, when uh, this approach is descriptive and scientific one, postulating an empir empirical investigation of architectural forms. Uh, and it's, uh, for example, Władysław Wuszkiewicz studies on Romanesque architecture. We had a presentation of our conference uh, also. And finally, a prescriptive one when dealing with the present purposes by defining the national style and postulating aesthetic choices. And uh, I will show some uh, strategies. Uh, the main strategy uh, in Poland were uh, asking, are there any exceptional individual features of our architecture? And uh, the competition for the uh, Warsaw Cathedral, uh, where his uh, its facade was too international, uh, showed this mechanism perfectly. And then uh, we found in Poland few solutions uh, like architectural romantic historicism, vernacular modes, of course, uh, by inventing national soul and, and early modernism, primeval shape of style and minor houses. And few more uh, examples, Vistula Baltic style uh, as a counterpart for the Orthodox church, uh, the competition from 18, uh, 86 uh, with the condition the church should be built in the pointed art uh, style. The church of St. Mary uh, in Krakow as a kind of a model for Gothic architecture in Poland and the body and the soul of all our, our of course, churches uh, repeated in few realizations all around the former Poland uh, or uh, challenging uh, the so-called Krakow system in uh, architecture uh, and creating uh, by Władysław Wuszkiewicz uh, the, this kind of Gothic uh, architecture, the typical Polish uh, one. And there is a, a system connecting brick with the stone elements and uh, this uh, kind of construction. And finally, for example, uh, Stelzy Gundowski created by uh, uh, Jan Sazubrzycki uh, and the style of Sigismund epoch is uh, treated as a nuance or, or variant of the Renaissance in uh, Poland. Uh, or this kind of columns and vase are typical for uh, or Slavic or Polish elements. And my conclusion. Uh, writing theory and history of style in, in Central Europe is uh, possible with recognizing common places and strategies uh, and identifying local choices. So I can uh, conclude that uh, we really share uh, the same mechanism while in uh, details uh, we differ uh, in particular choices. Thank you. And I will stop sharing and pass my voice to Anna. Thank you very much. And yeah, I will also start sharing my screen. Uh, so first of course, I would like to thank uh, New Europe College for hosting us and for continuing allowing us to continue working. And um, I would probably start with the fact that all these concepts which we discussed, they were envisioned by Adam, and that's why we continuously referencing to her work. Unfortunately, she didn't put it all, the, um, all her ideas into writing, but hopefully we will have something from her uh, in our book. And uh, uh, when we discuss the concept of, of style or influence, uh, so we somehow uh, check it against uh, the ideas proposed by Ada in her uh, concept and explained to us by Ada. So in the initial uh, proposal for this investigation, 
uh, that put three central notions of uh, periodization style and influence uh, in the core of uh, our work. And uh, the concept of influence was proposed as a mechanism which established uh, hierarchical relations within the center periphery paradigm. And thus, uh, in historiography of art history, the center uh, was a certain region or place which was kind of emanating influence. Uh, usually, it was a Western European, in, more, in some rare cases, uh, Byzantium would be also considered in historiography as a center. Uh, however, places placed on peripheries, they were receptive of this influence. So this, they were depicted in these art historiographies as uh, somehow inferior to the central places, passive and submissive to this reception of uh, influence, which was bringing progress and driving the emergence of new styles and new language of expression. Uh, thus, this uh, conception gave uh, a way for politicizing the ideas of uh, centers and peripheries. Because the um, centers emanating the influence, they were creating so-called canon or the grand narrative of art history. And they didn't have their national styles, but universal styles. However, the peripheries, in this sense, they were receptive to the canons of the centers and they were catching up, but creating their own national styles and national schools to be, to be included into their mainstream art history and mainstream development of art. Thus, they were in constant need of Western artists or builders or models to ensure the progress, uh, and this is a very important notion, progress and development uh, also connected with the influence and the progress, of the, uh, the progress of their art. So this discourse in a certain way uh, affected them, right, the art historians originating from this uh, so-called peripheral uh, domes and made them to look for influence in an act of self peripherization So they constantly started the narratives of their own art uh, with looking for influences from somewhere else. And this discourse uh, is still preserved into historiographies of some regions, uh, especially like Balkans or Central Europe up to nowadays, so that it's not so prominent, it's rather a latent notion, which is somehow hidden in the <coughs> big narratives of uh, art national art histories today. Uh, however, it's important that throughout the 20th century, uh, it, this notion of influence constantly had um, some kind of political tone. And uh, the notion, uh, it depended on where the, the influence was looked for. So whether it was also influenced from the West, so from the big empires of the West, like Austro-Hungarian, or from Russia, where it was big empire of the East, or Ottoman Empire. And similarly, by the scholars from these uh, regions, they used these notions uh, to include certain territories, the border areas of their own empire, into sphere of their influence. And, um, for example, in others' own research, uh, which she, for example, presented at the International European Revival Conference in Helsinki in January 2020, she argued that the idea of the artistic influence uh, was very present in this Central and South European uh, region, and it allowed to inscribe them uh, national schools of art and art history into this grand narrative of art history. So she had a paper entitled National Architectural Style from a, a Transnational Perspective, the Entanglements of Byzantine Style in Balkan Historiography at the Turn of the 20th Century. And she looked how uh, different art historical schools discussed um, uh, 
cross points between uh, articulation of national style by um, so she discussed how the the um, uh, notion of style was articulated between the national schools of art history and the foreign researchers. And other in this sense, she noted that um, German speaking uh, scholars were interested in identifying Western influences in Balkans as a part of their strategy of compiling their own national corpora of historical monuments. Similarly, Hungarian speaking actors so this Western influence as a proof of uh, Hungarian historical presence in the region. Uh, but is the local actors, like uh, the local art historians, needed these uh, Western features to establish the idea of national style as worthy and to include it into the European war. So, uh, for example, the inclusion of uh, national style as one of the grand style or somehow affiliated with um, uh, the Western features being influenced by the Western features, allowed uh, the imitation of um, this national historical style into uh, modern architecture. That's one of the examples which she proposed throughout her presentation. Similarly, she noticed that even um, the attempt to articulate national style through uh, something different than the West, all this was formulated into the terms of this realization style and influence. And when, um, for example, during this competition for Bulgarian Revival Museum, uh, the organizers of the competition tried to formulate something not completely relying on the Western dominating narratives, they still use the term of influence. And then they conceptualize it in idea of Muslim or Ottoman influence, uh, but still using this uh, word and this idea. And that's the quotation which she found uh, from the description of competition conditions. So the, Bulgarian architecture could be envisioned as influenced by Muslim. Uh, in my own case, uh, I encountered this idea of influence several times through uh, my research, since my research mainly uh, associated with so-called peripheral countries of uh, southeastern and central or eastern Europe. Uh, Serbia, Bulgaria, partially Romania. And now to illustrate how this notion of influence worked in uh, historiography, I will look closely at the case of discussing influence into Serbian architecture, which I somehow encountered when I worked on um, my paper dedicated to uh, Decheny. So, the notion of influence was in the center of the debates about Western architecture. And it was always and up to nowadays envisioned in these terms. Uh, even in attempt to discuss some this architecture somehow differently, uh, contemporary writers like Ida Sienkiewicz, uh, who teaches in the United States, she still calls this architecture hybrid. And this is something which I would like to add somehow to the concept proposed by Adam, as she put it as only influence, while I think in that we also need to look at the notion of hybridity as influence coming from more than one source. That's what happened actually on the peripheries of, uh, uh, in peripheries in general, in like European peripheries. Or for example, Vaislav Juric, uh, the scholar from previous generation envisioned this architecture as Oriental and Romanesque in different details at the same time. But uh, very often the discussion of uh, influence doesn't go beyond the discussion of certain details, some superficial similarities, like, I don't know, portals, carvings, frames, and so on. But it never goes to understanding of use or somehow interaction with architecture or the space created by this hybrid or influenced um, uh, architectural forms. 
And uh, you see this was kind of a progress starting from uh, Millet Mie in uh, beginning of 20th century up to Korach, uh, who wrote his book in 60s. So I don't go beyond since our project ended in the middle of uh, 20th century. But uh, at the core of their discussion of um, uh, urban architecture was influence of the time. So Miriam, as a pioneer of uh, studies of Serbian art, he proposed to develop to divide uh, entire architectural heritage of Serbia into, into three periods, <clears throat> and um, which would be exemplified by uh, so-called Drashka school, uh, built under patronage of Nemanici dynasty in the central, central Serbia in 12th and 13th century. Uh, second would go Serbo-Byzantine school, characterized by imitation for influence of Byzantine architectural tradition at the end of 13th, beginning of 14th century, and Marava school, which is a central or northern Serbia, uh, which he posed as a unique Serbian style uh, from uh, 13th and 17th ongoing till the Ottoman conquest. And of course, these ideas uh, proposed by Mia were nicely embraced by uh, Serbian heritage and cultural discourse because it uh, appeared in the time of a search for national sovereignty and national sovereign uh, heritage, which would be still inscribed into the discourse of European art. So uh, these cases of some kind of Western influence allowed uh, to consider Serbia in the sense of people, European. However, it's important that Miguel uh, conceptualized Serbia as a cross, as a point on the crossroad between Byzantine and Serbia or and Western influences. Thus, he actually started the discourse of hybridity. And when he uh, introduced Serbian art into his research, uh, he actually started with exactly notion of origins, some unknown kind of almost prehistorical origins uh, and influences. Uh, this way, the entire medieval history of Serbia was depicted as passing through various influences in search of certain national voice, which would be a crystallized, I would say, articulated in uh, the period exactly before the Ottoman conquest in Marava school. And he also started this search for uh, origins of Western influences. So you see, he thinks that uh, these uh, influences were coming from Lombardy, from the north, which will be the further main topic of discussion uh, between various art historians uh, dealing with this topic. Further, uh, I would like to turn your attention to the work of uh, Brie, uh, who actually, whose work actually was translated into Serbian and uh, published into Serbian, though he is a French um, art historian, because he introduced uh, not only the further development of ideas of cross point of various influences, but he actually developed the term of eclectic uh, in application or to uh, Serbian architectural heritage. So you see, he, he generally considers its art being eclectic and uh, borrowing. So artists through, from 13th to 15th century borrowed decoration for their ch churches. And more interestingly, he actually considered that they borrowed simultaneously from Lombardy, Dalmatia, Apulia, Constantinople, and even Caucasus and Armenia. In this sense, he actually relies on uh, Chigovsky's theory of uh, some Oriental uh, origins of uh, some medieval, whatever, Roma, Romanesque or even Byzantine art. And in this sense, uh, Serbia being the cross point of various influences uh, suited to the Serbia national position in 1920s is just some years after the Mies war, but Serbia already became the kingdom of Yugoslavia, quite international and recognized state. So uh, being so-called kind of gates to, from west to east and from east to west. However, however in 1940s, when um, 
Petković and Boskovic uh, wrote their book about Decini. Uh, this uh, internationalism kind of disappeared and actually it's already the Second World War. And uh, uh, important notion that uh, on the border of uh, Yugoslavia kingdom, you also have this uh, independent uh, Croatian state created by uh, in the support of uh, Nazi and fascist Italy. So uh, this kind of uh, genius or Catholic genius, how it was called usually the uh, master builder of Decini, uh, Vitus of Cotter was indeed a Franciscan monk. Uh, so they didn't want him to be responsible for the creation of the most important, uh, from the point of view of Serbs, um, monument, which also uh, was commissioned and hosted relics of uh, the most holy king of Serbia belonging to Nemanja Šibenicki. So they found, looked for kind of ways to make it much more international and not relying on people coming from this uh, mythic Croatian state. So that you see from, uh, for example, illustrations in visual row in which Boskovic and Petkovic uh, put uh, Decini, it is um, France and uh, Germany and Italy in general. So when they discussed uh, Decini, they proposed to look for influences simultaneously um, from uh, simultaneously from West, from Burgundy, and so on and so forth, and uh, also uh, for kind of hybridity of styles between uh, Gothic and um, Romanesque. So I would like to. Uh, yeah, and when we finally reach the period of uh, 60s, so post war Tito's Yugoslavia, uh, Vojslav Korich, whom I refer, he returns to the idea of uh, Vitus of Kotter uh, being so called the agent of this influence, because now it is a uh, Yugoslavia which uh, joined together uh, Croatia and Serbia, and this is a kind of friendship between nations uh, viewed historically. Uh, in the Middle Ages. So when I, I would like to finish my presentation with a uh, discussion of this very idea of um, influence, which I would like to put slightly different as a kind of hybridity or eclecticism or syncretism of two or more influences um, regarded in uh, non-standard, non-standard, non-canonic uh, monuments observed on so-called peripheries. And this would be a central notion for discussing influence in one or another way. And uh, also there is a need to discuss simultaneity or succession of influences, which would be a nice topic for a conference, but unfortunately we didn't really have it. And also to know that the idea of influence discussed in our Historiography was always an attempt to establish link or to establish connections. So it had also not only negative but also positive aspect. Uh, so going beyond only language of a national school. And in my case, when I try to do so, so to uh, kind of go beyond of simple influence, I looked actually how various features, uh, architectural features of Gothic or Romanesque and also Byzantine ground plan and Byzantine um, liturgical rite were merged to create one space. So I presented it in at my um, the conference dedicated to natural light, and then I just try to apply, let's say, notion of hybrid piety rather than hybrid architecture. So thank you very much, and I stop my demonstration of screen and. Um, pass it to Pazmin to conclude. Thank you. Yes, um, thank you, Anna. Um, the uh, great presentation, and thank you for um, everyone who came to listen to us. Uh, so my um, brief contribution um, is about or represents some 
represent some reflections about writing and tangled histories of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, as you already know by now, our project's main theoretical approach is that of entangled histories. Uh, it aims, and to quote again from um, Ada Haidu, to uh, I quote, to investigate the complex relationships between the art historiographies in the region, taking into consideration both how they relate to the developments of the discipline in Western Europe and how they related to um, each other. Um, and excellent examples of entangled histories, um, it is my pleasure to say that, are the chapters of our colleagues Michna and Anna. Uh, Michna Mikhail traces the competing views among Hungarian, Saxons, Germans and French scholars about the Gothic style in the heritage of the medieval Hungarian kingdom. And, um, and Ada, Ada Shinskaya uh, evaluates the entanglements between a wide range of actors from the Habsburg um, Russian French, um, French Greeks, Bulgarians, and Serbian writings about Byzantine art uh, in relation specifically to the concept of Byzantine Renaissance in the early 20th century. Um, however, um, in spite of the manifest goal of our volume to employ entangled history, uh, the majority of the contributions are still about or have taken one nation state as main reference unit, unit and they're therefore reaffirming its significance. Um, most of the focus was um, on single nation states, um, is on single nations. Um, and because uh, an entangled history approach also means to employ reflexivity, both with regards to the historical process and with regards to us as researchers, um, my talk will reflect um, particularly on this issue on why nation state remains so visible um, in our historical research. Um, one main reason we discussed as a team is historical and relates to the way the nation states in the region have developed in the modern period. Um, intellectual relations and the flow of ideas um, in the modern nation building period can be seen mostly uh, between Western and Central Europe and the Balkan states, and not among the states in the regions. Um, indeed, each Balkan country um, or Eastern European country sought to differentiate itself from the others while interacting with um, Western centers. Uh, an evocative example, I think, is the railroad develop development in the region, which, as Alexander Vezenko has noted, Made to, was made to connect, was built to connect the Balkan countries with the important European cities and not so much with their neighbors in the peninsula. So it was, for example, easier to travel from Bucharest directly by rail to Paris than to reach Belgrade, which was far closer in proximity. Therefore, even if uh, countries in the region have experienced similar and comparable processes, and these processes can be compared con and contrasted, still the relations among actors in the region, uh, region were not very visible and the major reference unit in the modern period remains the nation state. Um, our volume nevertheless move, moves beyond narrow national histories, even if the focus stays within one, one state. Um, my own contribution as well as that of others um, such as uh, Shona Karstuk, for example, emphasizes the significance of relations and cultural exchanges between actors based in Central and Eastern Europe and those in various Western artistic centers. In effect, um, in my research, all actors were more defined by their Western education, common cultural values and set, and set of practices than by their citizenship. Um, a late 19th century Romanian architect, for example, was more at ease in Paris and among fellow artists from all over Europe than he was in, um, say, a small Romanian town. Ge geography, space, and national borders were often not very significant. Indeed, 19th century artists and writers formed what can be termed as a horizontal Europe, characterized by mutual exchanges without hierarchies of power or uh, knowledge. Um, but coming back to my um, topic, 
A second reason for, uh, reason for why the framework of the nation state it is still prevalent in writings any, in and about Central and Eastern Europe is more methodological and relates to the way we write, teach, and think about our jobs as humanities researchers. Um, personally, I do not work in academia. I'm just a temporal postdoctoral researcher and can therefore make some observations as an outsider, reflecting, of course, also at things we discussed as a team in the past year. So um, I refer next to several institutional and practical obstacles to writing entangled histories. And the first one relates to the training we receive as researchers. Um, specifically, there are not many centers in the region for training of future scholars in histories of several countries and languages of the re region as required by an entangled history approach. Writings are very nationally focused, as in the case of Romania, where the research institutes mostly write about Romania with little expertise in other regions. And universities teach about Romanian art histories and Western art histories, um, especially in the, for the modern period. And here I have to say that Ada Hardu was an exception with her wonderful expertise and interest in the wider Central and Eastern Europe. And also the academic system is often wary of integrating new researchers and expertise. So the lack of, reach of expertise for the region has been perpetuated over time. Um, another obstacle um, in writing entangled histories relates to traveling and personal engagement with other countries. Writing entangled histories means following actors or, or object, uh, objects across nation states in often, often other national contexts. And this involves a sustained interest, or interest over years in those other countries. It requires a certain emotional and personal engagement that leads to knowledge of others' language, culture, and ways of thinking. And that makes it easier and even possible to write about other countries. As uh, the British historian of France, Colin Jones, noted, to write entangled histories means, I quote, to have the perception and historical judgment altered by prolonged exposure to another culture. End of quote. And many Western writers uh, uh, who write about Central and Eastern, Eastern Europe actually spend a lot of years in the region, often in various programs not related to research necessarily, such as the Peace Corps program of the United States. Um, Ada Haidu was again here a model scholar um, because she had friends throughout the regions travel often, often was acquainted intimately with Bulgarian culture, knew Serbian one very well, uh, and had um, language knowledge of Serbian, Bulgarian besides French, German, and English. Um, indeed, study of entanglements comes with a price, both material and personal. It is not cheap to spend a lot of time abroad, participate in, in international workshops or other meetings. And it also uh, involves a degree of disruption to one's private life. Um, moreover, in the region, it is often difficult or impossible to study uh, abroad um, because there is simply no mechanism to replace staff who are away not to mention money or support in applying for mobility fellowships such as Marie Curie. Um, another obstacle would be the interdisciplinarity and co collaborations. So on the one hand, there is an, inter an increased pressure for new interdisciplinary approaches and collaborative teams from the part of international funding bodies. Uh, on the other hand, you have the national institutions where the traditional separation of discipline and specialists is very visible. There is often the requirement that your PhD to be in the field or closely related to the field of your academic position. And there are few collaborations between scholars of neighboring disciplines or specialists in different historical periods, even if they are essential to, um, in throwing light on the intricate shared and contested history of the region. Collaborative projects are usually under the form of separate studies placed to together in chapters of the same book. Multi-author chapters, articles, or projects of collaborative writings are rare, 
Also international collaborations are a result of the international mobility that I mentioned, during which informal relations are a first step for future collaborations and for overcoming important obstacles, so, such as differences in ways of writing, of accessing or lack of access to archives, imbalance of sources, and so on. Um, but I want to conclude on, on, um, on a positive note, um, because in spite of these various issues that we thought uh, need highlighting, we believe our work and our volume takes important steps in the right direction. Uh, Ada Haidu noted when she proposed this project that, I quote, the literature in Central and Eastern Europe is rarely comparative, often nationalistic, and most of the time descriptive and uncritical. End of quote. We believe um, our collective volume together with other recent works represents a change of which we are proud. Uh, all contributes, contributions um, to our volume provide a critical reassessment of the art historiography in the region. They draw explicit comparisons with other case studies. They tend to be analytical in nature. They are less descriptive and the critical voices of the authors are generally presented throughout. Not least, they see um, nation states not as a given, but as a complex construct in which various elements can be deconstructed for the benefit of comparisons and for future analysis of the regional entanglements. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cosmin, and thank you to all my colleagues for bringing together so well the kinds of conversations we've been having in the project about these core concepts and about our methodological approach. Now, as I'm sure you'll have recognised, a lot of the issues we've been talking about are interdisciplinary, and I imagine perhaps chime with things you've, you've come up against in your own research. Um, one final point is I think that um, although our project is coming to an end, although we've lost ADA, we don't feel the door has closed. In fact, very much the opposite. We feel the project, the ideas, the encouragement she gave us has flung the door wide open for future ways of thinking about art historiography in the region and for developing all of our own practice and research in the field. So thank you very much to everybody for, for your time and your attention and I'll, I'll pass over to Professor Oroviano now. Thank you very much, thank you all. This was I think very informative and uh, rich and um, although we are uh, very much looking forward to the volume on periodization, and I am sure it will be a reflection of this richness. Uh, I can't help being very frustrated that other uh, conferences planned in the project will not happen, and that their outcomes will have to be uh, gleaned at in a, an indirect way rather than confronted in a more productive way as it would have been through conferences and. Um, uh, publications. But uh, I'd like also to give the chance to the audience to react, to ask questions, perhaps to make comments, uh, especially since, uh, as Shona just said, the concepts around which the project uh, was built may have some resonance across disciplines and may touch sensitivities that are not only art historical, but also come from other fields. So please, uh, if you feel like asking questions of any kind or making comments of any kind, you are most welcome. We still have uh, some generous time for this discussion. Yes, so Valentina wants to say something. Of course, Valentina. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Anka. Actually, you encouraged me because I thought the whole time uh, in this presentation that uh, uh, we, the uh, music historians, the musicologists could also profit very much from uh, your work because we have similar problems, similar questions. 
uh, I thought, for instance, uh, uh, this issue about style and period uh, that we inherited from the art history, it's traditionally inherited from there, uh, and now uh, it could be seen in a new light. So I just wanted to thank you and uh, to tell you that uh, I'm very grateful because you gave me a lot of things to start with, to think about. Uh, this is uh, what Anka said about across disciplines. So no questions, <laughs> just a thank you. Thank you very much, Valentina, for, for that comment. Um, but very interesting to know. Um, because I suppose we're interested to, to find out if, if anyone working in parallel disciplines has ever tried the methodology of entangled histories. I mean, yesterday I was giving a presentation to a group of historians actually and they came back at me with some quite tough questions about the methodology. They were actually quite critical of it in some ways. They, they were saying, how do you cope with the flattening out of power structures that you get with entangled histories, where you give every actor an equal voice? How do you then make sense of the cacophony that comes out of that? And, and my response was, well, we haven't experienced that, actually. We've been finding that <clears throat> looking in a comparative way actually emphasises power structures that were previously embedded and latent and not explicitly articulated. We've, we've found Entangled Histories is actually a very good way of lifting the veil and, and revealing ideological structures of, of, of power and discourse within art history. So I suppose we're interested if anyone else has, has tried to do this kind of horizontal comparative study in in art history or in other disciplines within East Central Europe? Well, I think uh, uh, in the present research, there is a group, um, but they are not uh, focusing on Central East Europe. They're trying to um, see a global history of music, uh, focusing on um, empires, post-colonialism, uh, and so on. Uh, so to rethink the, the view uh, on, on global history music, of music. But I think it's uh, different, and I don't know about a project uh, similar with yours, uh, focusing on this area. So I would, uh, I think uh, uh, I have a colleague who is very interested in doing this and uh, focusing on the nations, nationalists in this, uh, uh, part of Europe, uh, but he's planning to start a research. So uh, uh, I will tell him, maybe put you in contact with him because I think uh, he has to gain from this some experience. Yeah, th th thank you very much, Valentina. Thank you. Uh, sorry. I'd like to give the word to Mrs. Liliana Haidu, but she uh, asks your. Um, um, lenience because she will only be able to speak in Romanian. So please, Mrs. Haidu, you are most welcome to speak to us. Uh, uh, she's writing to me, thank you very much for what you have been doing. I am proud of Ada, as always, and of you. Da, doar că la mine eu sunt la serviciu, iar calculatorul meu nu are nici cameră web, nu are nici sonor. De ascultat, v-am ascultat pe telefon unui coleg și v-am văzut pe ecranul calculatorului meu. Dar eu cred că aveți sonor. Da, nu am, 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 am telefon. Auzim. Coleg, Auzim. Nu mă pricep, nu mă pricep să... <laughs> Vă auzim, vă auzim acum, da. Da. Uh, Îmi pare bine și vă mulțumesc pentru că m-ați invitat și pe mine să asist la expunerea dumneavoastră. Am înțeles foarte puțin pentru că nu vorbesc engleză, dar am urmărit cu atenție. Am văzut imaginile. Uh, Nu pot să mă exprim, să mi nu sunt de specialitate, dar sunt convinsă că a dat și mândră de ceea ce ați ce realizat. 
Și doresc în continuare să dezvoltați fiecare împreună sau individual ceea ce ați început. Și îmi doresc mie să fie în sensul în care ar fi plăcut și ei. Mulțumim mult, doamna Haidu. V vom transmite și celor care nu înțeleg românește ceea ce ați spus și sunt convinsă că așa se va întâmpla, că lucrurile vor continua. Și în ce ne privește, ne vom strădui dacă vom putea să sprijinim aceste continuări. Mulțumim! Vă mulțumesc! Vă doresc succes și numai bine! Well, I, I hope some of you have understood. Uh, in any case, she was thanking you all for what you are doing and hoping that you will continue. And I, on my side, am saying that we would like you to continue. <laughs> And we would like us to be able to support this continuation if possible, uh, if not at a general level, because it's beyond our means, at least at an individual level or at a modest, more modest level, or by seeking together other sources of, uh, of support than uh, ERC <laughs> in order to organize perhaps some, uh, some of the Uh, events that were foreseen and uh, you weren't able to organize because of because of the curtailing of this of this um, uh, project and for the moment in any case uh, you are you have of course an open invitation to the third and last seminar of the getty group on periodization and this will possibly be at least an opportunity to voice some of your concerns rather than, I don't know, uh, make a true contribution to your project, but at least to voice your concerns. And uh, this will be, uh, as Shona said at the beginning, uh, their presentation of the project in progress should have been uh, hosted in this periodization seminar, which uh, had been postponed from last May to this May. <laughs> And so we were hoping to have it uh, next week as, as it were, but we need needed to postpone it again for November. So this will have to be uh, in November. But for the moment, if there are other questions or um, comments or, uh, or uh, encouragements or anything from the audience, <laughs> I think Ankutza has a question. Ankutza signaled. Ankutza? Oh, yes, Ankutza, please. Yes, um, thank you very much for, for your presentation. I'm really, really sorry I couldn't be with you from the very beginning. So I was wondering whether you had any thoughts on horizontal methodologies, like on finding a, a neutral space, a neutral disciplinary space from which to, to, to approach the, these issues. Because you, 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 you've told us that you, most of the literature, it's, it's uncritical and it's, and yeah, so I was wondering whether, yeah, how, how, do, you, how, how do you deal with that and at, at a more methodological level? Or I, I don't know if, if it makes sense, but yeah. Do, do any of my colleagues want to, Magda, do, do you want to chip in there first? Yeah. Yes, as, um, uh, in general, uh, um, in my opinion, and, and I always said it in open words, I, I think that the methodology is uh, highly connected with the uh, all uh, worldview. So uh, I think that at some point, uh, this uh, horizontal uh, lying on uh, rather dismissing all this uh, power structures uh, so taken from this what uh, used to uh, did Andras uh, called uh, lemming style analysis but still in uh, Eastern Central Europe uh, I think this way of uh, demolishing the system uh, is not done because uh, I had a uh, few weeks ago, three weeks ago, I think I, I had an opportunity to present uh, my paper at the um, Commission on Art History of Polish Academy of Art and Sciences. And 
I was speaking about uh, Webkowski and so this uh, what I presented at the periodization uh, conference and uh, nobody understood me. Uh, so they, they declare, no, no, how, how can she deal with the kind of uh, uh, time structures uh, and uh, and the main uh, advice from uh, the supervisors of uh, PhD in uh, history of art history is uh, not right like Kuniska. So it's still uh, it's still a lot to be done. And this critical reflection, uh, I think it. I'm in a, such a good situation that uh, um, I'm hired at the university so uh, I can do my job properly but uh, I think that at some point so when you not deal with national uh, art history uh, it could be a problem to join any academia and uh, that's why and I'm really now I'm really concern about the situation in Poland, um, science, Polish science, and uh, we're going toward the nationalistic model again. So we will see what's, what's next. So that's my general rather set reflection. Mm -hmm. uh, can I just chip in a little comment to that? Ankutsa, I, I mean, it would be utopian, it would be wonderful to be neutral but I, I don't think it's possible. I think everything is political and bound up with power structures. I think the most we can aspire to is to be reflexive in a way that um, historiographies prior to this probably haven't been so reflexive. And I think by being reflexive, we learn. Um, but I also think our project is helped by the wider project of global art histories, which, um, you know, I work in a Western institution, it, it is extremely dominant there. This national box thinking that we talk about a lot in, in East Central Europe, that's, um, that's really considered um, passé now. So it's, for, for me, it's actually very interesting being on the interface in a way um, between two systems and it, it's, is certainly making me think very reflexively about my own practice in, in both teaching and research. But uh, I mean, please, anyone else chip in. I, I don't think we can get to a neutral methodology. I think we can just aspire to a, a reflexive methodology. If I may, I entirely agree with you. Uh, one can look for something that would be less tainted uh, locally, maybe, but neutral is an, a utopia to my mind. Uh, but I wanted to ask you, Shona, since you had this discussion uh, yesterday with your colleagues and that they were concerned that um, uh, an approach through entangled histories might have a flattening effect. Doesn't an approach at a worldwide level has a quite more flattening effect? I, I suppose that your that your colleagues embrace a worldwide approach, but are somehow wary of a regional one. <laughs> that, that's what I understood. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's there's two issues with it. There's firstly the, the issue, the, the lingering issue, particularly for someone in a British institution, of always being accused of having an imperial viewpoint on things. So even if we try and teach. Um, arts from other parts of the world, often you can be accused of speaking over and for those cultures rather than seeing them from the inside. And that goes back to the point that Cosmin was making with Entangled Histories, that it's actually very difficult to be able to see a lot of cultural situations from the inside and to understand them fully from the interior viewpoint rather than from the external viewpoint. I mean, it involves fantastic linguistic capacities, as well as he said, you know, really spending a lot of time there and, and trying to get inside a culture. So it, 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 is, it is an intrinsic problem of comparative histories, especially on a global scale. How can you ever possibly aspire to having an equal understanding of all the actors that you are trying to approach comparatively. Um, 
So, but precisely for this reason, entangled histories seem to be, seem, seem to me to be more realistic, uh, more pragmatic and more feasible because there you have a, uh, have a limited number of agents whom you are trying to somehow entangle and disentangle. Uh, and this seems to me more feasible than a, a global outlook, but let's let's wait and see. <clears throat> yes, I think you're right. You have to set the parameters. You have to limit the factors that you are addressing in a study like this. In order to be able to fund them, I think so as well, yes. Uh, can I briefly intervene? <laughs> Absolutely, please. Um, I, uh, I was... Um, thinking, uh, um, Shona, about global histories, which in many ways are not an exercise in reflexivity, um, in the way uh, Ankutsa was saying, in, in the sense that what I've noticed being in the UK as well, is that indeed there is this expansion of interest to all over the world, to the cultures all over, but um, often things that, that are um, basic elements of our writing remain unviewed, uh, not so critical, like for example, nationalism, national art, everything that constitutes Englishness or Britishness of um, art history. So in a way, um, when I came in the UK, I came from this kind of um, radical, uh, from the perspective of a radical critic of nationalism and nation states. And what I found out there is that no one actually contests this. So everyone looks at the idea of uh, national identities as very much something given, while at the same time exploring and uh, looking at other cultures and doing global history. I don't know if this makes sense. And briefly to respond to Ankutsa, uh, I think reflexivity is something key to our project. And in a way, how uh, Ada separated these three elements, style, period, influences, this was a way to uh, reflect critical, critically on what we do and the tools we work on uh, with. So it's uh, um, reflexivity here is, a, is the key that might in the future lead to a more horizontal ground in the region, a point to many points of intersections among the many national traditions. And of course, we are not yet here, but it's a work in progress. Okay. Uh, well, if there aren't any other questions or comments, I'd like to thank you again, uh, to thank you both for being here and for your wonderful work. I am, as I said, looking very much looking forward to the first product, pro, collective product of your efforts, uh, the volume on periodization, but I'm also looking forward to reading your individual contributions and to see you continue as much as you can on the lines you started with this. Pro There's a, a, a general thank you from Natalia and thank you Natalia for joining us. Um, and that's it. And see you soon all, I hope. <laughs> Can I uh, say a big thank you on behalf of all the team, for, particularly to Professor Arobiano for organizing this, but also to everybody who's attended. And I hope in some way it's been a, a little testament and memorial to the, the, the power of Ada's vision and ideas in, in launching this project. So thank you very much and we hope to see you in person in the not too distant future. Thank you and thank you very much also for giving such a high profile to Ada's presence in your contributions. I was particularly sensitive to this and I think others were as well. Thank you again and see you soon. <laughs>